Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of FNR Ask the Expert. So we've done updates on salamanders a few weeks ago, and we've done updates on various species um, on the hardwood ecosystem experiment and other things. Today, though, we're going to be talking about anurans. Just what are these species? Um, what makes them different? What research is going on um, in regarding their biology, um, threats to them, and also conservation efforts? So today we're joined by Dr. Rod Williams, Professor of Wildlife Science for Purdue FNR, Dr. Jason Hooverman, Associate Professor of Invertebrate Ecology in Purdue FNR, and Dr. Mike Lanou, who is Professor of Anatomy and Cell Biology at the Indiana University School of Medicine. So let's just start at the beginning. Dr. Lanou, fill us in, what are anurans for those people who don't know and what makes them different? Anurans are frogs and toads. And I think that uh, if you showed a picture of a frog or a toad to uh, any human being over about two years old, they would recognize it as a frog or a toad. Despite an Anthony's this conservative body plan, they're, they're short, stumpy animals with no neck. They have short forelimbs, short arms, and they tend to have long, hind limbs, long legs. Despite this uh, conservative body plan, they're incredibly diverse. So of the 8,000 or so species of amphibians that are on the planet currently, frogs and toads make up about 7,500 of them, over 90%. Um, they occur on all continents except Antarctica and Greenland. Is Greenland a continent? I think it is. And, uh, and they occupy uh, all sorts of habitats from the wettest habitats you can imagine to the driest habitats that you can imagine. They tend to have, although not always, what's called a complex life history. And so terrestrial Adults will lay eggs in water, and those eggs will hatch into tadpoles. Tadpoles are just as recognizable to little kids and adults as adult frogs are. And um, so they have this, what's called a complex life history. They spend part of their lives in habitats that are wet and part of their lives in habitats that are dry. So that in a nutshell, is what an anurin is. You're muted, Wendy. There's so many different species of anurins, as he was mentioning. Um, talk to us a little bit about the diversity of this group and um, kind of the wide range that we might find um, even in Indiana. So in our, our last Ask the Expert episode with regarding salamanders, we talked about the, the diversity in terms of numbers of species. Salamanders had about 500 species. And as, as Mike mentioned, we got you know, 7,500 species of, of anurans globally. Now, when you think about the local diversity here in Indiana, we've got 18 species of frogs and toads. Now, even though we only have 18 species, the diversity within those 18 species, especially when you're thinking about things like where they live, how they reproduce, but even things like their body size is tremendously diverse. You have some of our species, like our, our cricket frogs, which are not much larger than your thumbnail. And you can compare that to some of our larger species like the American bullfrog, which the, the frog itself is bigger than your entire hand. So just tremendous diversity, uh, tremendous diversity in, our, in the way they call. And, and that's one of the things that, that really sort of enamors people with regard to anurans over the salamanders, right? Salamanders are cryptic, they move at night, they live in wetlands, they live under logs, they're hard for people to see. Uh, you don't hear them uh, because they're secretive. Frogs are one of those wonderful amphibians that announce their presence. These males migrate to the breeding ponds and they're gonna call and announce their presence to try to attract uh, a female. And these calls, uh, there's a, it's called a phonology and we'll talk about that here in a little bit where it's almost predictable uh, when certain species are probably gonna start calling in the spring. And then if you're trained, just like you would go out and do birding and, and identify birds by ear, you can identify these various frog species in Indiana 
by their calls as well. And I think uh, Jason's going to play some frog calls for us here in just a minute. So uh, I've talked a little bit about the diversity. Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you. And why don't you show us some of the diversity, not only what the species look like, their morphology, but also their calls. Yeah, sure. So I put together a uh, PowerPoint here, share my screen. You guys can see that all right? All right. So go full screen here. Okay, so as Rod and Mike were kind of alluding to, again, we have broad diversity of species. You know, here in the state, we have about 18 different species. So I did is just kind of pull together a, a few images and then a few examples of some of the calls that these guys have. So this is uh, the uh, wood frog. So these guys actually just started breeding uh, the past couple of weeks. So once we had all that snow in Indiana start to melt off, uh, these guys started making their ways to ponds. And this is actually from last week down in Brown County. Um, so I'm gonna play the call here. Uh, you'll see the males kind of bouncing around in the pond here, uh, but their call is kind of like a, a, a duck, uh, kind of sounds like that. And also you hear in the background, some spring peepers calling as well. So let me play that for you. So in this particular pond, there's probably about 50 or so males um, that were calling at this time. You know, I had just come to the pond, kind of sat down uh, and waited, them, waited for them to, to start back up again. Um, but again, this is one of the, the early breeders. As we've talked about, there's a breeding phenology. So these guys are coming in um, pretty early. Uh, once that, again, that snow comes off, the ice melts, you know, they're getting active. Oop. Another cool species that we have uh, is the American toad. Uh, these guys are actually very bold callers. And one of the reasons for that is they have these very large poison glands on the back of their heads. Um, and again, if a predator comes across them, picks them up, even pierces these glands, uh, uh, a waxy, oozy substance will come out of those glands and uh, it's distasteful to those predators. So again, they can be pretty bold callers. So here's a male calling right here. And with these guys too, you can actually pick them up, put them in your hand, and they'll actually just start calling right on top of your hand as well. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but again, they'll call actually during the middle of the day as well. Uh, so just like those wood frogs you saw, most frogs aren't calling during the day because they want to avoid predators. But these guys, these uh, toads in particular, they love to call during the day because they know they're pretty toxic to, to predators. Okay, now one of my favorite species are the uh, gray tree frogs. Play the call for you here. Got one male sitting down here. You hear all the other males in the background, along with spring peepers again, pretty common in the background. Oh, that's my son who always take out on herping trips with me. He's actually picking him up there. And then drops him, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so one of my favorite species, tree frogs, they get their name because they have their toe pads. You can kind of see their toe pads here. So they're climbing up on vegetation up in those trees. They actually call from the trees as well. And then they make their way down to the pond uh, to start breeding uh, once it's time there. Another species that's starting to call this time of year as well are the um, chorus frogs. So see if I can play this. This is a, a recording here. That sounds like running your finger down a comb. Again, another one of the, the early breeders. Again, you can hear <laughs> peepers in the background in this call. And this is another one of those small species, kind of similar to the cricket frog that Rob was mentioning. Uh, this is the pickerel frog. They have a really interesting call as well. <laughs> you always have peepers in the background on these things. Uh, so these guys have these very squarish marks going down the back. They also have flash colors um, on the sides as well. Uh, another similar looking species is the uh, northern leopard frog, um, but really kind of look at the, the patterning on the back to distinguish those two species. And now we have the, uh, the American bullfrog. I think Rod mentioned them, one of our bigger, uh, probably the biggest species that we have um, for nerds in the state. Uh, very distinctive call that you'll hear in the summertime. Mm -hmm. 
Very cool species there. All right, what else do I have? Ah, the spadefoots. These guys have a very distinct call. Uh, what's really unique about them is they typically come out when you have very severe thunderstorms and lots of water on the landscape. Um, and another cool feature about them is they have a really rapid developmental period. So within you know, a couple of weeks, they actually go from egg to metamorph. So really, really rapid development. But the call, wherever I put that, sorry, over here. <laughs> but just very interesting call. You can imagine when you get them all together here. I think there's a course. Okay, uh, I think I have one more maybe. Let's see. Yes, so we have the green tree frog. So this, this particular species is unique because it's, it's kind of making its way up into Indiana. Uh, and a lot of that we think is driven maybe by climate change because we get warmer conditions and this is more of a Southern species. So it's kind of inching its way further and further North uh, in the state. But their call is, is really fascinating because it kind of sounds like a European siren. If you go, you know, listen to like a, a movie from, you know, Europe kind of have that, that uh, type of siren call to them. That's usually when they get really agitated with another male close by. Okay, so that's just you know about half of the species that we have. So all of them have very distinct kind of calls. I, mean, I can spend probably hours kind of going through and kind of listening to these types of things. But um, yeah, so that gives you kind of a, a brief introduction to some of the different types of calls that we have. Oop, gotta move this down for neurons in the state. So Jason, you mentioned something really um, important there um, about one of the species that having the poisonous um, areas on their back. Uh, is that something that as humans, we need to be worried about? Are there species in the state that are poisonous to humans or to our dogs or other animals that we may have out camping with us or out in the woods? I would say generally no. Um, typically, you know, pets, dogs in particular, will sometimes pick up uh, a toad or something like that. That's probably the one of more concern. But usually what happens is as soon as they bite down on those glands, they'll immediately drop that, that toad. Uh, but for humans, no concerns whatsoever. Um, but if we think about some of the other species, like poison dart frogs from South America, um, those got, got their name for a reason. Um, so they're uh, basically, you know, native people used to rub darts on top of those frogs and get the poison off those to actually um, hunt with. So again, if you do touch some of those species, that can uh, cause an issue, but nothing for our amphibians in the state. Well, I, I will just add that if you go farther south, I was talking to Jason and Mike earlier, uh, my daughter is actually going to Florida uh, tomorrow, and there are species in Florida like our cane toad, mm -hmm. which is a really, really large toad. And if you think about those poison glands on the American toad that Jason showed you, those are about the size of a pencil eraser. Uh, if you think about these cane toads, they're also called marine toads, you know, they can be half the size of your thumb, really large uh, poison glands. And now if cats or dogs were to attack a cane toad, it could cause some mortality if, if the dog really or the cat really attacks that toad, and it can make small children sick a little bit. So for people who are heading south uh, to Florida for things other than amphibians or reptiles, just be cognizant if you see a, a marine toad when you're handling it. Uh, and I'll just say, you know, e even though we don't have any frogs or toads in Indiana that are toxic, you know, in terms of causing really har harmful health uh, issues, they can cause some irritation to your mucosal lining. So if you touch one of these American toads and then rub your eye, it, it may cause some irritation to your eye. I was actually in Florida in 2005 with a good friend of mine, and we were herping during Hurricane Dennis, which is a fantastic time to go out and find frogs, uh, salamanders and snakes um, when there's a hurricane going through, maybe not the safest, but it is a great for when things are flooding and you can go to these little islands and catch amphibians and reptiles. And I was catching spadefoot toads. And I always tell my students in my herpetology class, when you're out doing herping and, and touching amphibians and reptiles, don't touch your face, don't touch your mouth, don't touch your nose. And it was pouring down rain and every, and we were catching spadefoots. It was my first time ever catching spadefoots. So I was so excited. I kept taking pictures and water kept dripping on my nose. I kept wiping my nose. And the next thing you know, my nose was burning. 
And I kept talking to my students. I'm like, I don't know why my nose is burning so badly. And they go, really, Dr. Williams? You always tell us not to touch your, your nose. And you've been touching these spade foots and then touching your nose. And it was causing some mild irritation. So the point of that story is don't put your hands in your nose and your mouth when you're handling amphibians. But it, it, could, it could cause some mild irritations. So just make sure you wash your hands before uh, doing that in Indiana. Thanks, the, other, the other point to that story is um, when you're out herping in Florida in a hurricane, you get blown away by the diversity. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to mention, and we talked about this, uh, Rod, with um, the salamanders, is the coloration can sometimes um, show us um, which ones are more dangerous to us or, or not. Um, is that the same thing with frogs and toads? I'll leave it open to whoever wants to cover that. In many cases, so the the, the dart frog, the poison dart frogs that Jason talked about in, in South America, those are very brightly colored because those are oftentimes some of the most toxic of, of our anurans. And so they have these really, really bright coloration to announce to any would-be predators not to handle or mess with them because they possess these toxins, which could be harmful if, if they were ingested or swallowed. So that's very consistent with what we talked about with the salamanders for sure. Well, let's get back to the fun things here um, and we'll hand it off to Dr. Lanou and um, talk to us a little bit more about what we're hearing out there. Um, some of the call phenology um, aspects that we might be aware of, of the ones that Jason was mentioning. Yeah, sure. And I'll just ask Jason to put up that PowerPoint slide on phenology, but you may, you may ask yourself, you know, frogs are, are what we might call, you know, cold blooded animals, they get their body temperature from uh, the outside temperature. And looking outside on a day like today, you may ask yourself, what would a frog be doing outside when it's so cold and wet and uncomfortable? Well, the earliest calling frogs in Indiana, which include the wood frogs, they're usually the first to call, and then spring peepers and chorus frogs. And then after that, leopard frogs and my favorite crawfish frogs all breed in seasonal or semi-permanent wetlands, wetlands that don't have fish in them in general. And because these wetlands fill with winter snow melt in the spring, spring runoff, and spring rains, they tend to be transient on the landscape. And so frogs breed in these wetlands because they don't have fish. That's the good thing. The bad thing is that they're temporary features on the landscape. So they want their tadpoles to have an opportunity to grow large enough, long enough, so that they can metamorphose. And so these early spring breeders get out into these wetlands as soon as temperatures are above freezing, even though they might be uncomfortable, and they breed and lay their eggs so that their eggs can hatch out and turn into tadpoles and metamorphose before these temporary water bodies dry up. In the middle of the, so you have spring breeders, and then you have summer breeders, and summer breeders are, are bullfrogs and green frogs, for example. And they breed early summer, and they don't really care that much about water permanence because they breed in lakes and, and permanent wetlands. And they generally have tadpoles that overwinter. So they take a long time to develop, uh, nine or 10 months, maybe a year. And, um, these lakes and permanent wetlands tend to not freeze all the way to the bottom. So these tadpoles survive. So they can they have much more flexibility when they can breed because they breed in larger wetlands that won't dry up. And their tadpoles you know, can take a long time. They've got the time. In between these spring breeders and these summer breeders are breeders like, like American toads. And, and they, they're not the first breeders out there, but they're not the last. American toads have a, have a quirky tadpole. Their tadpoles don't develop lungs 
until late. And so they can't utilize some of these seasonal and semi-permanent wetlands that are full of plants because these it, it, aquatic plants, because these aquatic plants, when they photosynthesize during the day, they respire just like animals at night. And so the dissolved oxygen levels in these uh, temporary basins can be quite low. And, and the tadpoles of, of leopard frogs and coarse frogs and spring peepers have lungs, so they can gulp air. And the tadpoles of American toads don't, at least till late, so they can't. So they'll actually suffocate in these wetlands. So what American toads do is they use their poison to their advantage. Their eggs are poisonous slightly, their tadpoles are poisonous, their tadpoles will also school. So they'll breed in these permanent bodies of water along with bullfrogs and green frogs. Uh, but they use schooling and poison glands to deter predators. As Rod said, or maybe Jason, help. Um, it was it with spadefoot toads, it was Jason. It says spadefoot toads, um, they'll breed whenever, no, maybe it was Rod. There's a big thunderstorm. And, and so what they rely on, and, and, and their tadpoles, their eggs hatch quickly, their tadpoles develop quickly. So what they rely on is these very temporary bodies of water uh, that are fishless. They breed in them, and they hope that their tadpoles can metamorphose before those tiny little puddles dry up. What did I miss? I think you covered it all. Um, you covered all of our different breeds and when we can see them. And I think this chart is very helpful. So maybe if we start hearing some of those noises out there, we can try and figure out what they are. Um, just a reminder, if you're watching us on Facebook, uh, put your questions in the comment section and our experts will answer them as we continue on. Um, Jason, that leads right into our next question. Um, Mike talked a little bit about the wetlands and, and how they dry up and some of the, psych the cyclical nature of that. But what is really the importance of wetlands when we talk about anurans, um, especially in Indiana? Yeah, so I mean, for uh, anurans in particular, because they require they have this complex life cycle and are putting their eggs into water bodies, these wetlands become extremely important. They're essential mm -hmm. habitats for them. Uh, so what I've put up here is just a, a variety of different types of wetlands that you can find uh, these guys breeding in. Uh, as Mike was kind of alluding to, we have species that exist at these very temporary extremes, like the wood frogs, all the way up to species, bullfrogs, green frogs. They're living in these more, more permanent habitats as, uh, as larvae. So uh, the larval stage obviously needs these water bodies are critically important uh, across the state. Um, if you think about Indiana, um, Mike might talk about this when it comes to conservation, but as a state, we've lost, I believe it's over 94% of our wetlands. Uh, and we start thinking about the conservation status of amphibians. If you remove one of the key components of their their habitat, you know it's not surprising that we see huge declines in amphibians. Um, and again, Mike, we'll probably come back to this a, a little later on. Um, but again, as Mike was kind of alluding to, all these species have different preferences for different types of habitat, so that helps to generate some diversity, biodiversity of amphibians in these areas as well. Um, does that pretty much capture? that point? Okay. Mike, do you want to cover a little bit about uh, frogs and toads in the upland areas before we move on to another topic? Sure. Um, again, even in, even in a, 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 a state with a relatively, I don't know, Indiana is not a, a huge state, but it's not a small state, we still have uh, quite a diversity of um, anurin upland habitats. And so um, thinking about wood frogs, um, leopard frogs, uh, toads, they're terrestrial and they tend to, to make their living on the soil surface, on the ground. Maybe there's some preference in some species for grasslands, some preference in other species for woodlands, but they're basically on the ground. Then you have tree frogs, like um, the gray tree frogs and the green tree frogs, that will tend primarily to make their living up in tree canopies, up at heights, um, but not always. 
but that's where you tend to find them. And then you have species like bullfrogs and green frogs that are aquatic for both you know, egg, tadpole, but as adults. Uh, and they spend um, a lot of their adult life in the shallows of lakes, in, in permanent wetlands, and yeah, they feed and yeah, find safety from predators. We have one strange frog in, uh, in the state that uh, crawfish frogs that uh, are obligate crayfish burrow dwellers. What that means is that as adults, you will only find them when they're not breeding in crayfish burrows, in burrows dug by crayfish. Um, this species is found in the southwestern portion of the state these days um, and is of, um, uh, yeah, pretty severe conservation concern. I believe, help me Rod, Jason, it's the only endangered frog species in the state. I think that's correct. In general, the, the, the more restrictive your, your habitat requirements, um, the, the more in conservation trouble you tend to be. So we have a question coming in from Shelby and she asks, so the tree frogs have a phenology more in the middle um, than all the others. Does that have anything to do with where the adults reside um, the rest of the year? No, I think it has more to do with where they lay their, their eggs and, uh, and have their tadpoles. And so, yeah, they're just a little bit later. They're, she's right, they're, they're after the first wave and they kind of precede toads. Uh, but man, uh, have I seen tree frog tadpoles in a lot of oddball environments. Um, <laughs> male tree frogs are, are kind of savvy. What they will tend to do, at least in neighborhoods like where I live, is they'll call from, from downspouts, gutters, and, and the tin acts as an amplifier. So, so it makes the male seem, seem much bigger. Um, this is why I wear bulky sweaters when I go to bars. Um, and, and then they will lay their eggs in like rain barrels. And so you'll look at rain barrels and you'll see the tadpoles there. And, and so I think that, that they have, um, but correct me, Jason and, and Rod, if I'm, if I'm incorrect, um, but they, they do lay their eggs in a wider variety of habitats. And these habitats tend to be a little bit more permanent so they can afford to breed just a little bit later. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. So for example, um, with the research we do, if we go take a, a pool and just put it out in the middle of a, a field, we'll sometimes get tree frogs in those, those areas. People often find them in their swimming pools as well. Um, so they are, they're good at getting their eggs pretty much everywhere. <laughs> so if there's a water body out there, they're going to take advantage of it. And that leads right into our next question, Jason. Um, what can live with frogs and toads and tadpoles um, in whatever wetland that they're in? I know uh, Michael mentioned that, you know, they don't necessarily like to be where fish are, um, but what can coexist peacefully with them? Yeah, I mean, I kind of go the reverse with that. So amphibians don't tend to get along very well with fish, um, as Mike was kind of getting at. So there's a very small subset that he was kind of talking about that can really coexist with fish. Um, otherwise, we see them overlapping with a broad diversity of invertebrate as well as vertebrate species. So you'll see them in with, you know, snakes and turtles and, you know, insects, you know, dragonfly larvae. So there's lots of things that eat them as well. So they're <clears throat> an important prey source for all those species I just mentioned. So invertebrates in particular, uh, things like predaceous diving beetles and dragonfly larvae, even leeches. Uh, will latch on to tadpoles. So um, they, yeah, they, they serve an important food res you know, important resource uh, for lots of different predators. Um, they're also primary consumers of algae. So they're in those ponds consuming, uh, especially in more permanent habitat, consuming algae um, or in things like the forest of ponds, they're actually uh, the detritivores. So they're eating a lot of detritus, breaking down leaf material, uh, fungi, those types of things in those water bodies as tadpoles. Uh, but yeah, they can coexist with a broad diversity of species. It's just those fish that really take, uh, take a toll on their populations. So I think Mike alluded to this earlier when he was talking about American toads, that small subset 
of anurans that can coexist with fish, their, their larvae, their tadpoles tend to be really unpalatable because of those, those toxins, the, those poisons in the glands. And that's what allows them to be able to coexist with fish. So we think of our bullfrogs, our green frogs, really, really not palatable, really distasteful to fish. So fish tend to leave them alone. If you were to introduce fish in some of these other ponds where those, those tadpoles are maybe don't have those kinds of toxins, those fish could devastate those anurin populations very, very quickly. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Another important trait for these tadpoles is activity level. Um, so many of the species that coexist with fish are also very low in activity levels outside the, again, the toads, which are highly toxic. Um, so green frogs in particular, they, they shut down their activity levels to such a degree that the, the fish generally don't see them. So they're kind of blending in with their surroundings. Like, don't, don't see me, I'm fine. Um, but if you look at the other extreme, things like the wood frogs, um, even to some extent, the great tree frogs um, are highly active. So the wood frogs have to be super active. They have to eat a lot to get out of those ponds before they dry. Uh, so those types of traits make them at high risk of predation, especially from fish and other invertebrates. We can back up just one second and talk about how unusual tadpoles are. So if you look at larval salamanders, they're carnivores. Adult salamanders are carnivores. Adult frogs are carnivores. Tadpoles are herbivores to trinivores. And they, they've developed this, this stumpy, chubby body that's just full of uh, this coiled intestine. And, and they're specialized to eat algae and detritus. Um, they, you see some carnivory, some, uh, um, they like to feed on, on dead conspecifics, I've noticed. Um, but in general, um, to see a filter feeding herbivore among you know, a family of carnivores is pretty unusual. And once frogs hit on this tadpole life history stage, it both created a lot of opportunities for them because plants are everywhere. But on the other hand, uh, and this is a morphology that's pretty stuck and it, it's hard to deviate very much from being a tadpole and be functional. It's like this in, in this stable node and there's this tadpole thing that's really successful, but you can't get away from it. There's no intermediate between a, a larval frog, a tadpole and an adult frog, like there are intermediates in salamanders. So before we move on, one question um, that probably a lot of people have is, um, what do they do in the winter? I mean, obviously, you know, we talked about that with salamanders and they, they kind of bury themselves and, and hide away until it's time for them to come out. Um, is that same with frogs? Are they, you know, kind of hiding away until it's safe to not freeze? Want me to take this? Yeah, it depends. And so um, um, toads uh, will definitely uh, use the, the salamander strategy and they will bury themselves down below the frost line. And um, I suppose spadefoots do the same thing. Um, big um, true frogs, rounded frogs, bullfrogs, green frogs will overwinter under um, the ice in lakes. And in fact, last week I received a picture from a friend, the bullfrogs were starting to emerge from Lake Michigan. And so they're able to breathe through their skin and they're able to stay submerged. Um, frogs like spring peepers, coarse frogs, gray tree frogs and wood frogs create antifreeze. And so they'll just lay in the detritus uh, in the soil and they produce this antifreeze and they sort of freeze and just tolerate winter as this inert frozen animal. And what's really cool about that, that antifreeze that Mike was talking about, if you think about that phenology chart, the species he mentioned. Yeah. Are the ones that breed the earliest. And so they're able to tolerate the cold. 
Yeah, and actually, if you uh, just Google frog sickle, um, you can get a pretty cool video on uh, on YouTube that kind of documents the wood frog going through that freeze thaw um, cycle. It, it's pretty amazing. They did kind of this uh, time elapsed video of wood frogs, uh, so it's pretty cool. So just a reminder, if you have any questions, put those in the comment section on Facebook and we will get to those. Um, so let's move on a little bit. We've talked about the species and, and where they live and, and those type of things, but what about conservation? What are some of the issues that um, some of these species are facing here in Indiana? The challenge to having a complex life history is that you need high quality habitats that meet your needs. And so when, when frogs breed in wetlands, they need high quality wetlands. And when frogs then metamorphose and, and move to the uplands, they need high quality uplands. And, and it's a, it's a, you need both. You can't have just one. And so if someone comes in and takes out a wetland, even though the uplands are great habitat, you're not going to have frogs there if they don't have any place to breathe. Or if there's a great wetland, but um, the adjacent upland is converted to a suburb, you may have great breeding habitat, but the, the uplands are trashed from a frog's perspective. And, and the example I always use are, are leopard frogs, which breed in wetlands. So their eggs and their tadpoles are in wetlands. As adults active during the warm season, they're in uplands, but they overwinter under the ice in lakes. So they need lake habitats, upland habitats, and wetland habitats, all within an area that they can reach. And that's kind of the second problem is, um, is they're just small animals um, with short legs and they just don't get around that much. So if a, if a wetland is destroyed, a, a natural wetland is destroyed, and a mitigated wetland is created two miles away, you're probably gonna lose those frogs, those frog populations, because two miles away is an awful long ways to go for a spring peeper that's an inch long, and how are they gonna find that place anyway? And so they don't have wings, they don't have big legs, they can't range, and they really have to make their stand locally. So yeah, so two, two issues with conservation, complex life histories, you need those habitats intact in close proximity to each other. And amphibians just don't move far fast. From a habitat perspective, there are other challenges too. And Jason can talk about disease, um, which has been a huge factor in amphibian conservation recently. Yeah, sure. Um... So amphibians, like all you know, free-living species, are challenged by a diversity of parasites and pathogens. Um, so there's things like parasitic uh, worms, trematodes, there's viruses, there's bacteria, uh, and fungi. So um, there's really kind of three main groups that have been of concern. Um, a fungus called the chytrid fungus. Um, there's a viral pathogen called ranavirus. And then there's a variety of trematodes, again, um, probably the, the most well-known is Riboria, which causes uh, malformations in amphibians. Um, now, most of these, uh, at least here in the United States, there's only a few areas where we've had huge concerns with something like chytrid fungus uh, actually caused declines. Um, in some cases, the crawfish frog here locally has um, been hit pretty hard by the chytrid fungus. But uh, most of these other pathogens, at least here in the state, haven't been too detrimental. Um, again, that's in contrast to what we see in places like the tropics where the chytrid fungus really went through and wiped out uh, amphibians uh, in those areas. Um, so that's places like Costa Rica, um, also some places in Australia, the coasts of Australia, as well as um, California as well. So some of the species there have taken a big hit from the chytrid fungus. Um, Ranaviruses are very widespread viruses of amphibians, um, haven't been uh, linked in too many cases to any severe declines. Um, what we do see is uh, some local die-offs associated with ranaviruses, but it doesn't seem to be kind of sustained um, impact on most of the populations. 
Um, trematodes are very widespread. Uh, one of the groups are the, the echinostomes. So if you go out to a pond or a wetland, you'll find echinostomes. Uh, most amphibians have these infections. It's kind of a background level of infection in some cases. Um, most trematodes have a really unique life cycle where they start off in snails. And then the amphibians actually pick up the infection as tadpoles. Uh, and then they metamorphose and they come up on land. And at that point, they can be consumed by things like birds, um, mammals, even reptiles, and that completes the parasite's life cycle. So the parasite, in addition to the amphibian, have a complex life cycle. The parasite also has a complex life cycle and depends on all these different hosts um, to survive. So it's a really interesting kind of disease system to think about. Um, but yeah, so from a disease perspective, we have a number kind of globally that are of concern. Uh, but at least here in the state, it seems to be maybe chytrid has um, been linked to a couple of declines. Um, but more broadly, I think we're okay in the state when it comes to kind of disease issues for the most part. So we have a question came in from Isabel and she said, someone mentioned that green tree frogs have moved north likely to climate change. How, has, how else has climate change affected anurin populations? Um, whoever wants to tackle that. I'll start. It's, it's, um, I find it really heartening that um, the discussion on climate has shifted from the terminology global warming to climate change, because what's really happening with climate change is uh, climate unpredictability. And so what frogs and toads have relied on for uh, you know, the entire uh, hundreds of millions of years of their existence is uh, a certain amount of predictability. And so you, you expect spring to happen in the spring and you expect rains and you expect um, the cold to go, the rains to come, the warm to happen. But if you start to interdigitate the warm and the cold, what you can get is um, populations that uh, are compromised in certain years. So you can have a warm spell early which gets frogs and toads moving. And then a normal cold snap when it should happen, except the amphibians are now in the wetlands and eggs that are laid at the surface will freeze. Another thing that, that you can get is droughts unpredictably. And so these seasonal and semi-permanent wetlands where the tadpoles are can experience drought, they can dry up you can have complete reproductive failure in those years. One year, not a huge deal, especially for frogs that live a long time, but it is a big deal for frogs that don't live a long time. I think the average age in cricket frogs is 18 months, which gives them one opportunity to breed on average. And so, and so, but, and even with that, if you string together a couple of these years, where climate does what climate isn't supposed to do, or climate hasn't historically done, and you can take out, you can knock out populations. Yeah, I just provide one example. Um, so this past, this past summer, we pretty much hit into a pretty strong drought. Um, and luckily we're getting some rain now, but you know, since I've started here at Purdue, was that nine years ago now, adding up pretty quick. Um, the temporary pond that we go to to collect amphibians has never been dry this time of year. And this is the first year I've ever seen that temporary wetland completely dry. Um, so luckily, hopefully some of this rain's gonna fill that thing up, but you know, that severe drought, you know, again, kind of unpredictable and you haven't seen it for nine years can have a pretty significant impact. I know last year, I think, you know, obviously we're talking about inurns, but um, going to Mike's point, the tiger salamanders came in super early last year uh, laid their eggs and then we had a hard freeze because I think that was maybe January or early February uh, it warmed up like 60 degrees for that entire week and then we had another cold snap and that eliminated the entire uh, breeding population that year all the eggs were gone um, all of them um, basically died so those types of variations are, are, are concerning when it comes to climate change. So that leads to our next question um, from John and he he's curious if, if there's a way to get some of the um, some of these species to settle in other areas, say you know a larger lake area or somewhere like that, where as some of these smaller streams or wetlands may be drying up. Is there is there a way that we can, as humans, try and help them, or is that just they're going to go where they want to go? 
I know John mentioned bullfrogs. Yeah, he should know that bullfrogs are definitely a mixed blessing. Bullfrogs will eat anything that they can fit into their mouths, including uh, small turtles, ducklings, um, um, newborn humans. So it's, it's, if he wants, I, I realize their calls are attractive. A lot of people find their calls attractive. Uh, but if I was going to introduce a big lake based frog to a, a lake in Indiana, I might choose green frogs. Their, their calls are sort of like plucking a flat banjo string. Uh, and they call almost all summer. And that can be just this pleasant. And they call during the day. And that can be just this pleasant in a kind of different way than bullfrogs. And um, green frogs don't eat children. So we don't encourage any species that eats children, but we'll we'll let it we'll let it slide for the bullfrog. But um, Rod, wrap us up here. Um, we're always about getting people out to go herping, as we call it. Um, and you mentioned going out in a hurricane. Obviously, we're not encouraging people to do that for their first time. But what are some of the tips you guys might have um, for people that are getting started that want to go out and experience nature in Indiana and, and see some of these species and get to know them a little bit better? Um, what are some of the resources maybe and what are some of the, um, the ways that they can get involved with what you guys are doing as well? So I, again, I think the nice thing about a neurons, besides the fact that they're highly vocal, is, you know, it is what goes back to what Jason was talking about. They inhabit a myriad of different types of wetlands, right? It, you don't have to have these temporary ponds. If you do, you have you can expect a certain cohort of inurns to use that. If you have a permanent lake or a pond, you can expect a certain, certain cohort there. So you can, if you have a body of water and you go there in the spring or summer, you're likely to see and hear frogs, right? So the, the best advice is to just go. And it's really good to go at, at night, and especially if it's drain, uh, drizzling rain or something, because that really elicits a lot of this breeding behavior. And I know, Wendy, you've done a great job of putting a lot of resources that, that Mike has produced and Jason has produced, some that we've produced together as colleagues. I would encourage people to click on the links that you've been providing in the, in the chat on, on this Facebook Live session so that people can go and see what in, in those resources oftentimes have really great tips on. I think one of the ones you shared was appreciating and enjoying reptiles. It's not only just how to, to visualize them and, and what where to go to, to hear the frog calls that Jason played for you earlier, but also how to photograph them, where to look. When's the best time to go to find certain species? So I think clicking on those links is a really great place to start as well. But the other thing I would say is there's there are lots of groups that just like the birders that go out regularly and, and go birding. There are herp groups that regularly go out and go herping. And I think the best thing that you can do, if you can find a Mike Lanou or a Jason Hooverman to attach yourself to and have them take you for the first time, they can show you things that you probably have missed if you don't have a familiarity with amphibians and uh, in, the, in the spring, especially frog calls. So I would just encourage you to go out with someone and, and explore on your own using the resources that we provided. So I'll turn it over to Jason and Mike, maybe they've got some other ideas. Yeah, I would say one of the great things about the nerds in particular is again, that call is it's so useful, right? So you can actually drive around in your car with your windows down and especially at night, you'll pass these things and they'll be screaming. So easy way to locate good uh, kind of amphibian breeding habitats um, to kind of explore. But, you know, one of the, you know, the easiest ways, I always like kind of a stretch of like 70 degree, um, you know, days, which usually happens in May here in Indiana. You get a stretch of 70 degrees, you get some rain. Man, that's a kind of prime time to go out and looking for uh, amphibians. You'll hear again, you'll kind of get that mix of early spring, or sorry, late spring, early summer breeders starting the call. Um, so I think that's kind of a great time to go out. But uh, yeah, lots of resources, as Rod said, for getting out there um, and just kind of exploring different areas and, and seeing these guys. People are interested. They're interested in the calls. I think they, they've come to people who are aware um, have come to expect frog calls in the spring. And uh, I think they enjoy them as much as they enjoy bird calls, everyone now, you know, walking it, I guess no one walks into work anymore because no one actually goes to work. But uh, uh, when you're outside in the morning, 
you know, you're picking up on the bird calls. It's louder this week than it was last week. And the same thing is true when you're out in the evening with frog calls. It's, uh, it's louder this week than it was last week. One point I want to make about the phenology is Indiana is a long state and spring tends to proceed north roughly 10 miles a day. And so, um, so you can, folks down in Evansville will hear calls, you know, whatever, a couple of weeks before people in Gary will hear calls. But um, if, if all things being considered, but um, if it warms up and it's dry and then there's a big rain, everyone calls everywhere all the time, starts. So, so yeah, I, I think people appreciate it. And I've had people who are not outdoorsy type people you know, comment on the frogs. They don't, know, they don't know what they are, but they know they're frogs and they're happy that they've started calling because that means that winter is over. We have a couple of quick questions um, as we get ready to head out the door here. Um, first of all, any suggestions of publicly accessible places um, that people who maybe live in more urban areas could go locally um, to experience um, the inurns? And then secondly, um, your go-to ID books or um, identification methods. speak don't everyone speak at once come on i know you guys are out there well it, de it depends on how far people are willing to travel and so we don't live in indianapolis so but half the people in indiana do and so i'm not sure of any places eagle creek reservoir or some places in there that people might go um to listen for frogs um this time of year my go-to place would be someplace like goose pond or hill and brand fish and wildlife area and, and now that my wife and I are empty nesters, you know, this time of year, we'll, we'll drive down there with a cooler full of something and just uh, hang out on the, on the gravel road. There's no traffic down there and just listen for frogs and, and make, an, make an evening of it. Um, and, but people who, who live in subdivisions, people who live near woods, um, every, every little ditch right now has a coarse frog population in it. In, in my experience, roadside ditches, you'll hear them just as you're driving by. Um, it's really loud. It's nothing and it's really loud. It's nothing again. Um, and so, you know, places like that, you can't really hang out at those places, but they're good places to hear them. And I suppose West Lafayette has a, a number of places like that. I think again, the fact that there's so much diversity in the wetland types that these endurance are using you you don't need you don't need a goose pond it's great to have goose pond right but you don't need hundreds of acres it can literally be as mike just said a small ephemeral pond it can be a, a borrow pit actually uh, in in many of our county parks will have some wetland body on them and almost in, invariably they'll at least hold green frogs and bullfrogs because they tend to be more permanent so you know if you just just pull up Google Earth and, and look for wetland areas. And, and my guess is this time of year, if there's a wetland area there, you're likely to hear a nurse calling. Yeah, like I was telling you guys earlier, I think if if you do some road cruising, kind of drive around at night with your windows down, um, that's a good way to locate areas. And then what you can do is, again, what Rod was saying, go on Google, Google Earth after that point and kind of say, okay, what type of area is this? Is it a state wildlife area? Um, I don't know. Uh, a land trust, something like that, that you might be able to access um, at night to kind of explore those areas. Um, that'd be kind of a, an approach that you could use to identify some cool sites. I live in a I live in a forty year old subdivision, and if I if I was out on my patio every night, I would hear coarse frogs, spring peepers, gray tree frogs, toads cricket frogs and spadefoot toads on my on my deck in a in a subdivision. Yeah. I think we covered all the bases today and um, certainly hope you are encouraged 
to go out and explore your local areas and your parks and things like that and just experience the sounds. Um, you don't necessarily have to pick them up or see them, but certainly you can hear them. Um, anything else you guys want to add? I think this has been super educational and, and hopefully um, we will make all of those things uh, uh, accessible in the comments section there on Facebook, including the phonology chart uh, that somebody has asked for. Um, so stay tuned on that. I'll have that up shortly. Um, anything else you guys want to add before we sign off? Well, thank you all for your knowledge and for sharing your experiences. And uh, we will be back on Ask the Expert on April 1st. That is not a joke. Um, and it will be back with Rod. So I hope you like seeing a smiley little face. Um, and uh, we will be talking then about snakes and turtles. So yet more species uh, that you might see emerging this spring. So that'll be at April 1st at noon and we will see you then. So with that, enjoy nature, get out, enjoy what the rain has left us and see what frogs you can see. <laughs>